be hard to see more folks straggling in. Hey, welcome everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for coming, um, including uh, the folks who are joining us by webcast. Um, I'm Nina Kim, for those who do don't know me. Um, I think it's now more or less an understatement to say that it's a very exciting time in hepatitis C therapy. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't know too many folks who are better suited to give us uh, an overview of the cutting edge than uh, David Wiles. Um, so Dr. Wiles is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of California, San Diego. He is a prominent leader in the field. He is a member of the Hep C Guidelines panel of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases and Infectious Disease Society of America. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, he is, he's also, in addition to that, um, been a uh, first author of more than a few uh, key sentinel trials uh, in co-infected patients of these novel therapies. And, um, and he's also one of the leading experts on hep C drug resistance, which is one of the reasons why I invited him, um, because it's an area that I hope to learn a little bit more about. So um, please, uh, please join me in welcoming David Wiles. Get this set here. Thanks, Nina. It's really my pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. And uh, as Nina said, I'm going to talk kind of really almost have two different talks in here. Um, the first part, I'll talk a little bit about uh, HCV therapy and those co-infected with HIV. Um, hopefully, as you'll see, we really our therapeutic approaches are the same for co-infected patients as they are for HCV mono-infected patients with Maybe two caveats that I'll delve a little more into. Drug interactions, which I actually won't spend a lot of time on. We could do a whole talk on just that. And then talk a little bit about maybe some places on the edges, if you will, of therapy where maybe we don't quite treat our co-infected patients exactly the same. I'm focusing on shorter therapy, the eight-week duration, and talk a little bit about that data. And then probably one of the biggest areas of at least my personal concerns in, in HIV hepatitis C co-infection is the risk of reinfection. Um, and for some of our, our populations we're treating. And then we'll kind of shift gears and go towards the resistance um, and talk about uh, resistance and how it impacts our therapy, therapeutic decisions and HCV, and even talking about the few patients who failed DA therapy, what, what we're going to be doing with those patients. So I think I've kind of already stated this, but these are the objectives um, for the talk. Um, so we have interferon-free therapy. We've had it for several years now. We could start actually the end of 2013, put together a, a non-FDA label-based interferon-free combination. And, and what that means is that there are some key considerations now that are really prominent with interferon-free ther therapy. You need to know your genotype, and you even need to know your subtype, particularly for genotype 1. It's really important to have a 1A, 1B subtype determination. You need to know your patient's fibrosis stage. Um, the DAAs, as I'll show you, and I think you already know, work extremely well, even in patients with cirrhosis. So it's, it does dictate how you treat them to some extent. Um, but one thing that's important there that should not be forgotten is you need to continue to screen patients for hepatocellular carcinoma, even once you cure them, if they have cirrhosis or even F3 fibrosis. So advanced bridging fibrosis, most people will screen them as if they're cirrhotic. I won't really touch on that more, but um, that's certainly something um, we need to keep in mind. You need to know their treatment history. So are they treatment naive or experienced? Um, and if they're experienced, did they get a DAA and what did they get before? And then drug interactions, like I said, for co-infected patients. And then perhaps most importantly, unfortunately still, is what insurance do they have? We were talking about that a little bit up here. I was trying to get a sense of what it's like in Washington State to get approvals. And it's still something we deal with. It's improved, um, I'd say, dramatically over the last year, at least for us in California. And I, I expect within another couple of years, some of this is going to seem rather silly, maybe even all the kind of hand-wringing we did or we were forced to do um, to get approval for medication. And then again, as I've already kind of stated, um, co-infection treatment is not really an issue from an efficacy standpoint anymore. So Nina alluded to this. I am part of the guidelines panel. And, I, and rather than take you through the guidelines and say, you know, this is where you use 12 weeks plus ribavirin, and this is where you can use 24, I, I just made this summary slide. And I'm not really going to delve into specific recommendations for each regimen in each patient population. That's something that even, you know, none of us remember all the time. And you still may be going to look and making sure you're doing the right thing. So. Um, I just want to kind of highlight that this resource is available. The, the guidance document is online. Um, it's updated very frequently. Um, we're preparing another update right now for the next approval to foster care of Belpatosphere. So I just laid out some generalities. I'm, um, again, highlighting for genotype 1 that you need to know 1A versus 1B. And actually, genotype 1 is where we saw the first recommendation with the approval of the most recent regimen, Elbosphere-Grosophobere, for actually baseline resistance testing 
prior to using an interferon-free DAA regimen. And we'll talk a little bit more about the data that underlies that recommendation. Genotype 2 has been one of the easier ones to, to treat, um, although we're going to see some evolution of that with some of the next approvals. And then genotype 3 is really the toughest to treat now, um, particularly genotype 3 cirrhotics. They're really the one patient population where we're not to 95% or higher uh, efficacy rates with uh, current therapeutic approaches. Um, they're, the again, the, the one that needs the most attention. So I'm just going to show a little bit of some phase 3 data, specifically in co-infection. Again, really, um, these data mirror the mono-infected studies, but I'll just show you a few of them and point out some highlights or maybe some differences in the co-infected studies. So this is the first one. This is with soft lodiposphere in the so-called ION4 study, and Susanna Nagy led this. Um, and it was a single-arm study, and it took really all co-infected comers in terms of treatment experience or treatment naive and cirrhotic or non-cirrhotic and treated them with a single regimen of 12 weeks, um, no ribavirin of lodiposphere sulfosfavir. This is a combination of an NS5A inhibitor plus a nucleotide inhibitor in one fixed dose combination pill. Again, it, they allowed HCV genotype 1 or 4. Um, up to 20% were cirrhotic. It wasn't that quite high in, what, in the patients that were actually enrolled. And then here's probably the, the thing to focus on in all co-infected studies is what antiretroviral therapy was allowed into the study, right? And in this case, you, you'll notice the absence of ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitors. Ifavirenz was there as a non-nuke, raltegravir and rilpivirine, um, but again, no uh, ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitors. And so you have to think about that as you're, as you're looking to treat your co-infected patients. Um, the, the issue or the potential issue here is that lodiposphere in particular boosts tenofovir levels in plasma. So if you're giving a patient TDF, um, they're going to get an increase in their tenofovir plasma exposure, somewhere probably around 40% increase in the geometric mean ratio of plasma tenofovir. And that's the, high, the highest boosting is with ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitors. They already, those patients already tend to have higher tenofovir serum levels. And so the concern and the reason they were excluded from this study was do you get potentiation of potential toxic effects, particularly, I think, renal toxic effects are the, the main concern in a short-term study. And so, again, they were excluded here. We'll come back and talk with the drug interactions about how you could probably still treat that population as long as you're careful. Um, of ter in terms of patients actually enrolled, 82% um, male, uh, a third African-American, and that's a trend in co-infected studies. They tend to have a better representation of African-Americans. And the vast majority were genotype 1. And these are the response rates, and you'll get used to seeing numbers like this. So overall, 96% SVR12 rate, so HCV RNA repeated three months after they've stopped taking the medications. And that's what we use in HCV trials as are generally the primary endpoint and uh, the endpoint associated or as a surrogate for cure. And then I'll show you some data later that's been presented that that is very durable um, and, and really is a very good uh, clinical endpoint or surrogate for cure of HCV. And then you can just see across the different kind of strata of patients, treatment naive or treatment experience, cirrhotic or non-cirrhotic, really performed equally well in all these groups. Um, the thing that's been talked about with this study, there were 10 patients who relapsed. They happened all 10 to be African-American patients, and eight of those 10 were on a favorin. Amifavirenz actually lowers lodiposphere levels by about um, 40 percent, um, presumably through induction of maybe transporters, actually, since lodiposphere is not really a cyp 3 a 4 substrate. Um, now, um, when they actually looked at drug levels in a kind of a, a secondary analysis, there was actually no difference in lodiposphere exposure between patients on afavirenz in this study and on either raltegravir or rilpivirine. So it wasn't immediately apparent that that was the reason for the lower response rates, and I think we actually still don't really know um, why uh, this was found. It was statistically significant in this study, though. So another regimen that looks very similar is sofosfavir, again, the nucleotide plus another NS5 antagonist, the cladosphere. These are not co-formulated, which does give you some flexibility in dosing, particularly in a co-infected population where you may want to do some dose adjustment of the NS5A inhibitor. In this, in this study, we randomized um, treatment-naive patients, and this is the, the one, uh, you know, um, randomized trial that looked at uh, eight weeks of therapy in a co-infected population with sofosfavir plus an NS5A inhibitor. So you can see here, um, two to one randomized 12 to eight weeks in treatment naive patients, treatment experienced patients all got 12 weeks of therapy. The cladosphere is also a little different from lodiposphere in that it's um, more pangenotypic. Lodiposphere loses significant activity against genotypes two and three, whereas the cladosphere maintains um, a therapeutic activity. So in this study, uh, any genotype was allowed to enroll. Um, again, treatment naive or treatment experience. 
Um, as you, we're seeing in many of our co-infected studies going down to lower CD4 counts uh, as kind of the, the lower level for enrollment, down to 100 here. Um, and again, because of this flexibility in dosing in that you don't see necessarily the potentiation in tenofovir plasma exposure as you do with lodiposphere, um, in this study, really any antiretroviral regimen was allowed. The only exception would be a mixed inducer inhibitor like efavirenz plus ritonavir boosted protease inhibitor if you would happen to have anybody on that. Um, that was the only combination you couldn't do. Otherwise, you could have any antiretroviral regimen you wanted. So that's, I think, the highlight for this study. And again, uh, about a third of the patients were African American. And so these were the results overall. Again, 96% overall for 12-week pa patients who were treatment naive, 98% treatment experience, but then down to 76% um, in genotype 1 for um, use of eight weeks of therapy. And this was the study that I think kind of made people wonder if we should really be treating co-infected patients with eight weeks of therapy. Um, it's only listed as an alternative in the package label for soft lodiposphere, and that was based on a phase three study in HCV mono-infected patients. Um, and so the question of whether we should be doing that in co-infected patients I think is still an open one. Um, in general, we don't do it in our clinic, in our practice. We don't use eight weeks. If we get an insurance company saying, oh, this patient qualifies for eight weeks of therapy, but they're co-infected, we will push back. Um, and the qualification, sorry, I should have gone through that, would be a treatment-naive patient who's non-serotic and then has a viral load less than 6 million. Um, admittedly, that last criterion, the less than 6 million viral load, was a post hoc kind of retrospective analysis of different viral load strata um, that was picked out, essentially, to equalize the relapse rates, the virologic relapse rates between 8 and 12 weeks. Um, there, there's another publication in Open Forms of Infectious Disease that actually shows that there's really no statistically significant difference between any of those strata. Um, but it was the one where the numerically the relapse rate, so patients who had viremia recur after they stopped therapy were identical between 12 and 8 weeks. Uh, the SVR rates were statistically no different in the overall study between 8 and 12 weeks. But again, um, we, we often use this and the guidance um, as ammunition, if you will, to get that extra four weeks in our co-infected patients right now. Oops. And then this is just, so why, why did the patients in this study do poorly or, or not do as well anyway with eight weeks? And this just breaks down kind of the, the characteristics, looking at different things. You can look at it by race. You don't really see a striking difference, certainly not the way you would expect where patients with black race would be maybe expected to have a lower SVR rate. Now, viral load did kind of come out again in that if you got below 2 million, everybody responded. But, um, you know, that's not really statistically um, uh, significant or powerful. Um, cirrhotics, there were cirrhotics allowed, so that is a departure from what would have been done in the uh, ION3 study. Um, so we did allow cirrhotics in here, and you can see three of five. Perhaps most striking was it turned out that just by chance, the, in the eight-week group, they were overrepresented with patients on ritonavir-boosted darunavir. And I kind of glossed over it, but in patients on boosted protease inhibitors in this study, they got 30 milligrams of decladosphere as opposed to the standard 60 milligrams, presumably due to the boosting effect. Um, and that was modeled only based on the adizanavir-ritonavir interaction data in healthy volunteers. There was not actual drug-drug interaction data with darunavir at the time the study was planned and executed. Afterwards, drug interaction data um, suggested that the boosting effect in darunavir-ritonavir was not as great as adizanavir-ritonavir. And so now if you look in the package insert for decladosphere, the recommendation would be to do full 60 milligram dose in somebody on darunavir-ritonavir or lopinavir-ritonavir. Um, and uh, Plasma levels of the cladosphere were slightly lower. It didn't come out, to, it didn't look statistically significant in this analysis, small numbers of patients. So it wasn't clear that it was a drug exposure issue that led to some of this difference, but at least numerically, patients that were on darunavir did seem to be lower than the other groups of antiretroviral therapy. And so should you use eight weeks with lodiposphere cefosfavir in co-infected patients? Again, slightly different drug. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of kind of real-world cohort data. This data comes from the German. It's called the Gecko cohort. It's, again, kind of a real world. I, I, I use that a little um, hesitantly because most of the time these real world cohorts are still coming from academic centers um, with providers that are probably very experienced in treating hepatitis C. But in their real world cohort, they looked at it. They had 191 patients treated with eight weeks that were HCV mono-infected and 26 patients co-infected treated. And they had a 92% SVR rate in both groups. Um, so 
you know, um, the, the thing about these cohorts, they weren't exactly strict about who got into eight weeks. There were a few that were treatment experienced that worked their way in, real world, I guess. There were a few that had viral loads above six million. But it looked roughly similar. I, I would say what has certainly happened from large real world cohorts over the last year or so is our confidence in using eight weeks in mono-infected patients, I think, is has grown. Um, in other words, we have the HCV target database that showed an identical 97% SVR rate with, with pretty significant numbers of patients between 12 and 8 weeks. Um, a VA database showed a 92% or 91%. Now, and there again, they had a very mixed bag and had more patients that should not necessarily or did not meet the, the listed criteria to be treated with 8 weeks. And then again, um, most recently at the European Liver Meeting about a month ago, um, a large series of cohorts presented four or five different real-world cohorts um, again, showed a combined 97% uh, SVR rate with eight weeks. So I, I think, at least personally, for HCV mono-infected patients, we do pretty routinely use eight weeks um, with this regimen. But again, we're not doing it in our co-infected population right now. Not sure we're ever going to get a definitive answer for our co-infected patients. Maybe Scenics can come up with something like that. Um, so the, the so-called 3D regimen is another regimen that's um, uh, approved now, and there's some uh, data with this regimen in co-infected patients. About 60 patients were treated um, with good SVR rates, 94 to 97%. You'll see here the 24-week arm, so this is 24 weeks of treatment, six months, um, at SVR 12 went down to 91%. I really kept this in here because that was all due to two reinfections that occurred within three months of finishing therapy. Um, these were two patients who had high-risk exposures that were pretty well documented um, by the site investigators and, and did have reinfections that were phylogenetically um, pretty convincingly reinfections in that they looked very disparate from their original isolate despite being 1A uh, both at baseline and then at reinfection. And that's an issue, I think, with co-infected patients. If they get reinfected, most are probably going to have 1A to start with and get reinfected with if they get reinfected. So we can't rely on a genotype switch to help us figure that out. Um, and in a routine clinical practice, you probably won't be able to figure it out unless you see a real characteristic new acute presentation with LFTs that go way up um, and a viral load that's, that's pretty wildly fluctuating when you first capture them again. Um, that usually doesn't happen when patients relapse. When relapse, we see their LFTs just kind of come up to you, usually back to that, you know, 60 to 100 or wherever they were. We don't see those big flares. Um, so that may be something you can use, but it's going to be difficult to tell, I think, in a lot of patients. Um, one of the outstanding questions with this regimen in co-infected patients was um, the use of darunavir. Um, the data I just showed you from the turquoise study, only, those patients were only allowed to be on atazanavir or raltegravir in that study. Um, the potential issue with darunavir is that the, um, the so-called 3D regimen, which is an NS5A inhibitor, a ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitor plus a non-nucleoside, actually lowers darunavir concentrations. Darunavir trough concentrations drop by about 45% in healthy volunteers. And so the concern was not um, for the impact it had on the HCV regimen was, you know, you're lowering darunavir trough concentrations. Darunavir is often used in patients who have HIV resistance, have failed prior regimens. So, you know, do we want to treat their HCV? Uh, what's the risk of HIV breakthrough during that treatment? And so in this study, um, patients were stable on Q-day darunavir and were randomized uh, two weeks before they would start HCV study drug to either continue on Q-Day or one-to-one, uh, -one, some went to BID darunavir for two weeks to allow them to get close to steady state, and then they started treatment with the 3D regimen. You can see here um, 22 patients in each arm. This is, these are the, this is the HIV virologic suppression rate. So you can see there was one patient who, between screening and baseline, now had a detectable HIV RNA. Um, there was one patient at the end of treatment um, who had a detectable HIV RNA, um, and then one patient at post-treatment week 12 follow-up. So there did not seem to be any signal for breakthroughs. Actually, all these patients were above 40 but below 200. They were all different patients, and they all resuppressed with just continuing their regimen. Um, so it looked safe. And then the PK was relatively reassuring in that actually in a co-infected population, slightly less impact than was seen in healthy volunteers. And again, another uh, instance where Healthy volunteer data doesn't quite recapitulate what we see in terms of PK and co-infected or HIV-infected patients, period. But you can see here, the ones that stayed on darunavir Q-Day, they did have about a 35% decrease in their darunavir trough concentration. When they went up to BID, um, compared to day zero at, um, at four weeks, they were down by about 17%, so roughly 20% decrease. Um, I think the 20% 
most people could live with and wouldn't worry too much about this. This one, you know, 35%, you're starting to get, again, into that range where at least customarily we start to worry about is this clinically significant change in exposure. And again, particularly if you have somebody that's on BID, Darunavir coming in, who's got a lot of drug resistance, you know, with a lot of other options, I think it's always the question of, you know, how much are you willing to risk here with when you have a lot of other great options that you might be able to treat their HCV with. But we're starting to accumulate a little bit of this data, and there's a phase three study ongoing that will allow patients on Darunavir as well, so we'll have more data. So this is the, the last kind of kid on the block that was approved in January, Elbosphere Grisoprovir. It's another fixed dose combination. This is an NS5A inhibitor plus protease inhibitor, kind of a next generation or at least a 1.5 generation protease inhibitor, in that this is once a day more potent. It's, it's pangenotypic, really, except genotype 3, it has activity, maybe not enough to be used kind of just with these two. Um, and it has a better resistance profile than prior generation protease inhibitors. So this was um, a study that Jurgen Rockstro led, uh, a single arm study, again, to over 200 patients, fixed dose combination, one tablet once a day, 12 weeks, allowed genotype 1, 4, or 6 patients. This was a treatment-naive only study. Um, and you can see, again, we're, the, the main limitation here is the antiretroviral therapy allowed. So raltegravir, ropivirine, or dolutegravir. So no favorins, it's uh, grisoprovir is a CYP3A4 substrate, so you do get significant decreases in grisoprovir exposure. Um, and then um, no boosted protease inhibitors because you see a, a quite a, a large increase in grisoprovir exposures with boosted protease inhibitors. And it probably is important to remember grisoprovir was evaluated in phase two. It doses up in 300, 400 milligrams, and those were stopped because there was a slight signal of, of ALT elevations with higher doses. So it is something to keep in mind and probably not a place you want to go in, in terms of trying it in somebody on a rotonavir boosted protease inhibitor for their HIV. And so these were the results. Again, demographics as we expect in a co-infected population, 84% were male. Uh, not quite the representation of black patients here. This was um, both a European and U.S. study. Um, these are the, their antiretroviral regimens and how they broke out. And then you can see response rates, again, great in that 95-plus range, 96% overall. Um, you don't get the hint here. Uh, 1As and 1Bs did very well, 94 and 96%, including 100% in patients with cirrhosis, and there were 35 this regimen seems to be, um, has done very well in cirrhotic patients throughout all the studies, mono-infected, co-infected, phase two, and phase three studies. In fact, most all those studies, the cirrhotic patients actually have slightly higher SVR rates. Um, we don't think we really know why that is. We do know levels of grisoprovir particularly tend to go up, um, particularly though once you get to child's B and C cirrhotics, which were always excluded from these studies. Um, so there may be a little higher exposure even in, in compensated cirrhotics, child's QA. Um, and then it also accumulates very heavily inside hepatocytes, so people have wondered if just this accumulation um, may make it look a little better in patients with cirrhosis. But we, we don't know that for sure. I'll just point out here, here's kind of the hint in terms of about 1As. Um, most of the viral relapses were in the genotype 1A patients, um, but this study really doesn't show you what I'll show you later when we talk about resistance is the impact of baseline NS5A resistance and why we do baseline resistance testing in 1As with this regimen using that to try to advance. So I'm, I'm now stepping into Jen Kaiser's area of expertise, so I'll just show this as kind of a, my, my poor man's version of her uh, interaction chart. And, and Jen has a, a, an updated one that is on the guidelines site. Um, and I'm not going to walk through all of this. I think the, the things to point out are, one, integrase inhibitors are your friends in terms of um, trying to treat patients for hepatitis C. They essentially pretty much go with anything. Um, so you can use those pretty widely, and we certainly do in our clinic just in general in HIV-positive patients now. Um, and then the issue, I've kind of got them here generally in, in light green. Maybe I could have made them yellow, but w maybe we're also getting a little more cavalier with this. It's just a reminder that if a patient's on uh, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, what you have to worry about with soft lodiposphere in particular is lodiposphere increasing plasma tenofovir concentrations, and then that can be exacerbated by particularly ritonavir boosted protease numbers. So you've kind of got this three-way interaction. Um, if you look at the package insert for soft lodiposphere, the recommendation would be to consider alternative therapy if you can, and if you feel like you need to still use soft lodiposphere in, in an HIV-positive patient who is on a ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitor with tenofovir, is that you probably do some extra monitoring to watch their renal function during therapy. What that usually means for us is we'll repeat uh, a serum creatinine, usually at week two, along with the UA. Um, and at week four, 
seeing how the patient's doing at that point, then deciding whether we're going to do it monthly, they're out, or just recheck them maybe at end of therapy. Um, we're also probably a little more hesitant if somebody has other reasons to have underlying renal disease or at baseline already has proteinuria, so you know, do they have diabetes, hypertension, ha already have evidence of a little renal dysfunction. If we can, we would probably steer away in that case um, from that interaction anyway and look at either can we get them off TDF, we're using more and more TAF. We think that's probably going to be a great option in this setting. Um, and you'll notice, I didn't really point out, but ECF, TAF, anyway, um, based on drug interaction data is, is predicted to be fine. There's not really clinical data yet to support that. Um, or if you can, you know, switching out the ritonavir boosted protease inhibitor maybe for something like dolutegravir if, if you're comfortable with that depending on what their resistance history is and things like that. So that's really what I'm going to say about drug interactions. Um, so the, the recent European liver meeting, I think this is, I'm going to show you, this is, I think, maybe the only slide regarding co-infection. I thought it was interesting. There are a lot of real-world cohorts. Uh, the mantra is HIV doesn't impact HCV treatment responses, right? With these potent DAAs, they do just as well. And that's really every clinical study that's been done. Now, a lot of them are smaller phase two studies have suggested that, that it doesn't look like um, HIV adversely affects, affects the responses. Of course, those are all cross-study comparisons. There are not many studies that have looked within the same trial uh, at a co-infected versus mono-infected population. But this was uh, a set of studies uh, from two Spanish cohorts, HEPAVIR and, and GHEP, um, that looked at uh, specifically this issue of does HIV co-infection affect DAA responses. So they had about 400 patients each, mono-infected, co-infected. Now I think there are some issues with the patients. So one, the co-infected patients had more cirrhosis. They were, they were about 20, uh, much more genotype 1A. I didn't put genotype 3 up here. Genotype 3 was also more prevalent in their co-infected population. A lot more injection drug use in their co-infected population. The, their uh, risks are a little different than maybe most of our patients over here. Um, and maybe a little more treatment experience. But what they found in their overall analysis, this is the kind of intention to treat, if you will. In, in other words, including patients who were lost to follow-up. 95% um, SVR rate for mono-infected, 89% for co-infected patients. They did additional analyses. They look at patients just with uh, kind of a per-protocol analysis, just for ones that had biologic outcome data. Uh, and they did a multivariate analysis. And they did, in their multivariate analysis, the two things that predicted non-SVR were associated with non-SVR were HIV-positive patients and cirrhotic patients. And these are the adjusted odds ratios and the p-values here in the, for the, the multivariate p-values. Um, there were three other cohorts that suggested no difference. Um, so I picked this one out. Nina? You know, that, that's a great point. So they didn't specifically point them out here either. They didn't give you the SVR rates based on the different regimens. And in some of the other cohorts, that was an, a very important difference in responses. It wasn't difference in response between co-infected and mono-infected. But a lot of the other big cohorts, you see everybody was using SimSoft first because that was the first available, right? And so cirrhotic patients tend to be overrepresented in SimSoft data. And it was earlier treatment. We weren't as experienced. And the recommendation was 12 weeks for, or a lot of people were using 12 weeks in cirrhotic patients because we didn't have the recommendation to do 24. So for instance, USC presented a couple large cohorts that they had. And what you saw in the VA cohorts, the SVR rates were lower for patients treated with soft sim, but they were also much more uh, a cirrhotic population. The, there was another Spanish cohort that also presented, so I think the big thing here is cirrhosis is not a binary variable. Um, and they use FibroScan quite a bit. There was another Spanish cohort that presented their actual FibroScan data, right? And the co-infected patients had higher FibroScan values than the mono-infected. They were about 10 points higher. Um, and a lot of them were now getting into child's pew B and C. So I think that's a, a key thing we would like to know here is, is you know, what was the plate that count? What was their albumin? Or, or what was their FibroScan? I think we do think that's a pretty good surrogate for hepatic uh, venous pressure gradients. If you have a fiber scan value over 21 kilopascals, that's been shown to correlate nicely with HVPG and risk of variceal bleeding, say, from other cohorts. So I thought this was interesting because it came up. I think I then put in these were two of the bigger cohorts from the United States anyway that showed no difference. So um, it's always uh, we have cohort experts here, so they could talk more about all the limitations and uh, of cohorts. But I, I worry that I don't I just don't want the message to get out necessarily that HIV adversely expects uh, impacts DA responses, but we'll see. So uh, the last, in terms of co-infection, just talk about what's coming next. So actually about a month from now, maybe six weeks, we expect to have the next regimen approved. This is cefosfavir velpatosfir. 
So valpatosphere is another NS5A inhibitor. It's, it's a little different than lodiposphere in that it is really truly pangenotypic. It has activity across the HCV genotype spectrum, one through six. It also has a, a better resistance barrier, um, particularly for the Y93H in genotype 1B patients and pretty much everything except the Y93H in 1A. And so this was a uh, phase three study, single arm again, 12 weeks of soft valpatosphere, so-called astral five study. We had already seen astral one through four, which were HCV mono-infected studies presented and actually published in New England Journal end of 2015. Um, so this was the co-infected study though. Uh, allowed all genotypes, one through six. Again, treatment naive or experienced, and could be up to 30% cirrhotic, although we only had 18% in this study. And then antiretroviral regimens, um, so more inclusive here. Um, particularly, protease inhibitors with ritonavir were allowed in this study. Integrase inhibitors, the, the notable uh, um, missing uh, in terms of NNRTIs were a fav was a favorins. Again, valpatosphere, um, does have more CYP3A4 reliance as well as transporter issues, and there you see about a 50% decrease in belpatosphere exposure with the fibrin. So that's really the one that should be not be co-administered. Um, it's also interesting, though, this, this regimen also increases tenofovir levels by about 30 to 40%, so it's really not different. Um, I think a couple of things happened. One, there was some ex more experience with using sofalodiposphere in patients that were on rotonavir-boosted PIs and a general signal that it was safe. Um, and the short duration of therapy felt like if patients came in and they were required to have a creatinine clearance above 60 to come in, um, that it would be safe or at least worth studying uh, and making sure it looks safe in this study. Um, these are the populations. Almost half of them were African American in this study. Again, in theme with co-infected studies. And here's the overall response rates. Uh, you probably can't tell the difference between this graph and one I've shown for any other regimen, about 95%. Um, and across the genotypes, um, you can see here, um, in terms of um, non-SVR patients, there are actually a fair number of lost polyps. There were only um, two viral relapses in the genotype 1A group. All the rest were kind of lost to follow-ups or withdrawal of consent in terms of the failures. Um, and 100% in cirrhotic patients and 97% in treatment experienced. Um, so here's the creatinine clearance data. Um, these are the median creatinine clearances, and you can see, I'll just point out, the non tenofovir containing regimens actually started out lower. These patients had kind of probably been self-selected. They were taken off tenofovir for a reason, we think, a lot of them. So at the time they started, they had a lower creatinine clearance. They were still above the entry criteria at 60. You can see over time, in patients on non-boosted TDF, no change at all. You know, there is this hint that initially in week one, week two, you see a little drop in creatinine clearance in patients on boosted tenofovir. Um, but it does come back up to about baseline by week six. There were no patients that had to discontinue because of changes in creatinine or they, they met any of the criteria to stop. There were four patients in the whole study who had a creatinine increase of 0.4 milligrams per deciliter. Um, all of them were on TDF. Three of the four were on tenofovir boosted with a boosted regimen. Um, but almost all of them also had underlying diabetes, hypertension, and other kind of comorbidities that may, may affect uh, the kidneys. But again, none stopped uh, during the course of therapy. This is the data I was linked to about very low rates of relapse after SVR12. This is over 5,000 patients that are followed in a long-term kind of registry after being treated with a cefosphere plus lodiposphere based regimen. Um, and again, 99.7% maintained SVR. They had follow-up out to uh, over three years now. Um, and in terms of late viral relapse is 0.1%. So six patients out of over 5,400 that have had a late relapse. So again, we really, or at least personally, I feel very confident um, talking to patients. And if, if they're, they've attained an SVR12, I tell them they're cured of their HCV. I say, we're going to check again probably in a year or so just to make sure. And I, the big issue now is, is the next one to talk about this with patients who are HIV and hepatitis C co-infected, particularly our HIV positive MSMs who are still very sexually active. And um, we've seen reinfections that we think are sexually transmitted. So these are the two patients from that turquoise study I showed you. I'm just showing you a patient who had a true relapse. The virus looks indistinguishable between their baseline and their post-treatment week two when this relapse occurred. But then you can see patients here, baseline and post-treatment week eight when the relapse occurred, very different viruses. The other thing you can look at with DAAs if you're trying to get an idea, if you do resistance testing and don't see any resistance mutations, you might infer that that is a new infection as opposed to a relapse. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but that is another thing you can look at. And in fact, the patients who did have reinfection did not have any resistance mutations in this study. You'd probably expect about 80% of patients failing otherwise to have resistance mutations. 
And then this is the data that Andrew Hill initially presented at ASLD, then kind of updated in CROI and has now been published in CID with essentially the same number, slightly different. This was really a meta-analysis of published studies looking at rates of reinfection. Low risk group was anybody who was not an injection drug user or a prisoner and was not HIV co-infected. They were thrown into the low risk group. And there you can see the five year risk of reinfection was somewhere around 1.2%, I think, or 1.8% in this study. If you have a person who injects drugs or prisoners, higher reinfection rate around 8%. But then the highest was in HIV co-infected, almost 22% reinfection rate over five years. Now, this was from published studies. And I think the, the one important caveat is these, these studies, a lot of them tended to be of patients who had presented with acute HCV infection. In other words, a population that had already demonstrated they were going to be able to do something to get themselves infected with HCV in terms of their risk behaviors. So this is probably the highest risk group. Um, I think we have to be careful about extrapolating this to any of our co-infected patients. Some co-infected patients, uh, either in, in stable relationships or monogamous or were injection drug users, you know, decades ago and have been clean for a long time, are not going to have this risk of reinfection. But it certainly is uh, something to keep in mind um, when you're talking to patients. And then at the European Liver Meeting, they presented their data from kind of a Western, the NEAT group um, from Western Europe, presented their reinfection rates. And again, these were MSM in Western Europe, these had all presented with acute infection. They had um, about 606 that had presented with an incident infection. And then over the time period, 25% had a first infection. You can see here, 7.6 per 100 person years. And by three years, a quarter had been reinfected in this cohort. And they did have patients. They had about 30 patients who went on and got a second reinfection. And, and a third reinfection, even one patient who got reinfected a fourth time. So this is, again, you know, questions come up, should you not treat patients, or what should you do? I mean, we, we're, we're treating anybody we find with um, HCV, even acute infections. Um, but I think it's a lot of work to be done yet in terms of prevention and messages to our patients. Um, so on that, this is, I think, the last treatment I'll talk about before I get to resistance, is treatment of acute HCV infection. So this is still an evolving field with DAAs in general, and I think particularly for HIV co-infected patients. So this is, again, from CROI. This is, um, I, I combined two studies. One is one that Susanna Nagy presented actually earlier. This was an ACTG study that had a first arm that looked at 12 weeks of soft ribovirin for patients with acute infection. They were all HIV co-infected. Um, now, we obviously don't use soft ribovirin for any genotype 1 anymore. If you were using it when you, when you could consider it, it was 24 weeks, right, for chronic HCV genotype 1. So this was kind of building on the idea that we had seen or the, the phenomenon we had seen with interferon, that if you identify somebody in the acute stage, you could shorten therapy with an interferon-based regimen and still get very high SVR rates. So it didn't pan out really with soft lodiposphere or soft ribovirin for 12 weeks. You only saw a 60% SVR rate. They were all virologic relapses um, in those who failed. And then um, the European group came along and did six weeks of soft lodiposphere. And this is what Jurgen presented at CROI. A, a little better. You were up to 77%. I will point out, maybe I have it, the graphic in here, yeah, that you know, that was an uh, uh, intention to treat analysis. And they did have some loss to follow up. And if you look at that, it came up to 83%. And then there was one reinfection as well. So if you take out that reinfection, you were getting close to you know 87%, I think. Um, but there were 15% relapse rate, which is still kind of in the era of DAAs unacceptably high. 15% relapse rate right now. They, you know, the same phenomenon of viral load at baseline coming up. So all the failures were in the highest viral loads. Is that viral load itself? I think the other thing to think about, you know, an acute infection, viral load is, is really pretty volatile. And what I wonder about or worry about, you know, the patients down here, they, they didn't have a set waiting period. And so they were just treating them when they'd find them. They had definitions, you know, usually had ALT 10 times above the upper limit of normal with a new RNA or a documented seroconversion. Um, but they would just treat them when they found them and so weren't necessarily waiting to see if they were clearing on their own. And I think one of the things you may be getting here, especially this person you know, that has uh, uh, 10 copies of virus right, at their baseline visit, you know, was that patient going to clear on their own? right? So um, there are some, it's tricky to do acute infection studies. How long do you wait and when do you start? Um, I think I took out their slide. I, the the take home message is right now I would treat any acutes you find as if they're chronic with the same regimens, the same approach as with DAs. Um, yeah, I took out 
There was a German cohort that presented a mono-infected study at Easel. They had 100% SVR rate with six weeks of soft and dipospir in 20 mono-infected patients. But they were all symptomatic. Most of them were jaundiced when they presented. And again, they had a, a large number of patients. I think almost 75% were below a million um, and many more below 100,000. So again, it's this whole issue of how many are you treating that we're going to cure anyway, clear anyway. Okay. Now we're going to move to resistance. Um, so these are the my, my key resistance com, uh, concepts. So HCV resistance associated variants, or what we'll call RAVs, can be present without drug exposure. Um, I think that's, I think most of you are infectious disease, HIV physicians, and so with viruses, that's maybe not a completely foreign concept to you. It's because the virus replicates to such a high level and to an error prone polymerase that just by kind of replication and, and error, you see resistance mutants generated and become part of the viral quasi-species without drug exposure. HCV rabs impact treatment responses in specific situations. So um, it kind of fits with this next one that HCV resistance is not absolute. So just because somebody has a resistance-associated variant for a drug doesn't mean you won't use that drug or that class. And it may mean you don't change anything depending on the other characteristics of that patient. Are they treatment naive or treatment experienced? What's the actual genotype we're talking about here? And do they have cirrhosis? So again, for HCV, resistance is not absolute. And in fact, you're probably going to be using a lot of drugs that are quote unquote resistance in patients despite that. Patient characteristics are just, if not more important than RAVs. I'll come back to that a little bit. And that future regimens, they may obvi obviate the need for resistance testing. I actually think we're kind of at the peak of when we're going to be worrying about resistance and doing testing. I'll show you a little data with some of the future regimens that suggest, I think, depending on how they're priced and what we're forced to use, we may not, may not be doing a lot of resistance testing. So just to characterize, I've already alluded to this. Um, protease inhibitors, relatively low barrier to resistance, although with more recent uh, introductions, grazoprevir, we're starting to get to a moderate resistance barrier. Um, nucleotides. So sofosfor is the only one we have right now. They have an extraordinarily high barrier to resistance. Um, you rarely see it in patients who fail. Less than 1% are actually going to have sofosfor resistance when they fail, and that 1% quickly loses the resistance mutation, at least by sequencing. So we really almost don't worry about it here, I would say. This is the class where we worry most about resistance, NS5A inhibitors. They have a low barrier to resistance. With all the members of this group we have right now, there's extensive cross-resistance. So if you're resistant to one, you're generally going to be resistant to all of them. And these are the ones that seem to have the most clinical impact. And that's why we're really worrying about them right now. So first, before we talk about the resistance, can you test for it? Well, yes, you can. Um, there are a number of places that have their own, depending on how large the institution is. Mayo has their own hidden house resistance they do. The VA, if you work in the VA, that all gets sent to Palo Alto, and they do their own. But otherwise, most people, I think, are sending it to one of two places. They're either going through lab core monogram or they're going through Quest. And they are different assays, and I think that's maybe important to know. I'm not sure you really need to know, actually. Um, but what is done, so lab core or monogram does a deep sequencing assay. So they do do next generation sequencing. But what they're reporting to you is what's present in 10% of the viral population or 10% of the quasi-species. So it's kind of a deep assay, but giving you kind of a pseudo population readout, OK? And then Quest does um, standard population sequencing, more of what we think of detecting you know, resistance that's present roughly in 20, 25% of the viral population. Um, and their assay is now available for genotype 1 and genotype 3. For genotype 1, you really do need to know the subtype. Um, they're going to ask you, and, and there are specific primers that are used based on 1A versus 1B. They're not the same. And we found more than one patient who we got a line probe that said they're 1A and they were not 1A because they couldn't do the resistance testing. And sometimes they get these little fragments where they tell you, well, from what we can see, it looks like it's a, you know, what we had a 1C and some other random stuff. So, so this is just the example of the report you get. The Quest is more of a, you know, just a printout that'll tell you you have resistance predicted or not. But then um, for Monogram, they recently changed it, and it's, I think, a good change. It, it no longer is this red resistant. It says resistance possible. There's all these caveats down here which you can't read and probably don't want to. Um, but it indicates that same concept that resistance is not absolute. And in fact, despite having resistance, you very well may be or probably will be using one of these drugs. You're just going to alter your approach to treating the patient. You may extend, you may add ribavirin, you may do both. Um, but you're not going to necessarily go away from that drug class. So terminology has been confusing um, and still is. Uh, I'll just say what, what you should really focus on are what I would say are drug-specific RAVs. 
So while there's a lot of cross resistance, say, with NS5A inhibitors, it's not absolute. Um, so for whatever drug you're looking at, um, you really want to know those specific amino acid substitutions that affect that drug. And I think that's intuitive. You don't want to be looking at polymorphism. Um, but this has kind of been presented different ways. And so there's a lot of confusion in the literature. And that's why you'll see rates of NS5A resistance vary widely. And I'll show you that on this next slide. So I know it's hard to read, it's a little blurry, but the, the gray slices here are the percent that have NS5A resistance, OK? And so if you do population sequencing, obviously you find less. Is it, then if you do deep sequencing, you go down to 1%. Um, and then you can say any NS5A inhibitor, any amino acid substitution that causes resistance um, versus the drug-specific ones. And so again, this, this is the population we really worry about. And there you can see for, say, Elbosphere, by population sequencing in genotype 1A, you can expect somewhere around 5 to 10% of patients to have what may be clinically significant NS5A resistance. And that's a generalization. Um, in genotype 1B, you can see the, the prevalence of resistant variants is higher overall. These are all treatment-naive patients, so never exposed to an NS5A inhibitor. But this is all I'm going to say about genotype 1B because we don't care about it going forward, at least in a treatment-naive population. If somebody failed DAAs, then I care. Um, but for treatment-naive patients, we don't care about resistance in genotype 1B. So this issue of baseline versus selective, this is really just all my, most of this is hypothesis, but they're probably not the same. Um, somebody who has baseline resistance never been exposed and somebody who's failed an interferon-free DA regimen and now has resistance, one, the patient is just very different. Whether it's due to viral changes or just the patient's substrate, you know, cirrhosis, why they're not responding is very different. But I think there are potentials when, when somebody has selective resistance, now you tend to have multiple variants as opposed to a single variant. They tend to all be high-fold change variants. They're generally, at least at initial failure, present almost in 100% of the viral quasi-species. Um, but again, I think this is the biggest difference. These now, you, you've not only selected virus, you've selected out a patient that's difficult to treat. And uh, certainly not all of it is the virus they have. A lot of it is the patient themselves, I think. Whether that's, again, advanced liver disease, maybe something about their immune system, which we really don't understand, or they don't like to take pills very well. Um, that's another patient that you select out. So once you do select for resistance, the, you know, the hope was with hep C that they'd all go away. Not like HIV where it has this memory, but at least for the NS5A inhibitors, that doesn't seem to happen, at least over the two-year time span. The majority have maintained their resistance mutations over two years of follow-up. And I alluded to the cross-resistance. I don't expect you to study this, but we're going to come back and talk a lot about Y93H. This is the big, bad resistance mutation in NS5A. It causes broad cross-resistance. Even to velpatosphere in 1As, uh, the Y93H mutation still causes a large fold shift, but not in 1Bs. But again, the, these resistance mutations, a lot of cross-resistance, and are the ones we're worrying about when we're sequencing patients. So we'll talk a lot about Elbosphere grisoprevir, but um, this has kind of been an evolving story about does baseline NS5A resistance impact Ladiposphere sofosbuvir? Um, I think the initial message was no. Um, but now what you see is this was a kind of a compendium of, of patients treated um, through phase two and phase three, broken down by uh, essentially the regimens that would be recommended in the label. So a treatment naive population, your recommendation, whether they're cirrhotic or not cirrhotic, is 12 weeks no ribavirin. And you can see here, it doesn't look like baseline resistance has any impact. These are all ladiposphere specific RAVs, but they are at a 1% deep sequencing cutoff. And this is combined 1As and 1Bs. But where you see a potential impact is in treatment experience patients. So treatment experience non cirrhotic where the recommendation um, is uh, 12 weeks. Treatment experience cirrhotic, where the recommendation is either 12 weeks plus ribavirin or 24, you can see about a 10% difference in responses by whether they have baseline resistance or not. Um, the numbers are not huge for some of these, but reasonable certainly in these groups, only 15 here treated for 24 weeks, but I think suggests that there, there is an effect. Um, so the question becomes, well, what do you do? Yes, they, they, these are, none of these are DAA treatment experience. These are all PEG ribavirin. Good point. Thanks. So the question is, well, what do you do? Um, the only thing you could potentially do, I think, is uh, just focus over here is, so this is a study with cirrhotic patients where 24 weeks plus ribavirin, there are no failures, including patients with baseline resistance. It's 14 patients, 100%. Um, um, you still see the impact with baseline resistance in a cirrhotic population with 
24 weeks without ribavirin. Here it suggests that 12 weeks ribavirin may be doing something. So ribavirin kind of re-emerging as something that may be helpful for you if you have resistance. Um, the way we took this data in the guidelines was to say you have a, a treatment experience patient, particularly treatment experience cirrhotic, um, that you're thinking about using soft lipidosphere, you could consider getting baseline NS5A resistance testing. If you have it, um, the option would be to do 24 weeks plus ribavirin. We've tried that in two or three patients and had the insurance say, you can have the 24 weeks, but you can't have the riba. Uh, and we're like, really? I mean, you know, it's like $35 generic uh, a month. But um, we've had that scenario uh, come up. So it's something you can consider. I certainly can't tell you that it's based on a high numbers or statistically significant differences in responses, but that's a, a consideration. So here's where resistance really plays an impact, and this is why it's in the label. So this is with Elbosphere Grosophere. Again, we're only talking about genotype 1A patients. These are uh, treatment-naive patients here we're showing you. So again, by population sequencing, the 5% that had baseline Elbosphere RABs, they don't have it 98%. If they did have it, it went down to 58%. Um, again, not large numbers. 24 patients here is the denominator. And then you can see how you can dilute out the effect if you take in kind of irrelevant RABs or do population sequencing. You increase your denominator, but you're not picking up any more where it's clinically significant. So it was this data along with this data, which was an integrated analysis of all their phase two and phase three studies in genotype 1A patients that were treated with 12 weeks, no ribavirin. And you can see here, the only factors that impacted were viral load was statistically significant. And then baseline NS5A resistance, you saw about a 10% decrement overall. And there, here's the um, effective odds ratio, 0.1 for SVR and the p-value. I think it was based on, I didn't show you the treatment experience data, but it, it's that same decrement. It actually goes down to 29% in a treatment experience patient if they have baseline RABs and get just 12 weeks no ribavirin. So it was based on this that the FDA decided to make the recommendation for baseline resistance testing. For any genotype 1A patient, you're thinking about using Elbosphere grosoprevir, you do baseline NS5A resistance testing. If you have it, you extend to 16 weeks and add ribavirin, or you might consider a, a different regimen. Um, these are the other places I already alluded to this as well with this data to consider in a treatment experience, particularly cirrhotic, um, and where you could consider extending. Um, genotype 3, I have a few slides at the end, but we might not get to it. Uh, so for genotype 3, the Y93H is the problem, and, and if they're non cirrhotic we are starting to do baseline resistance testing in our genotype 3 non cirrhotic patients. And if, the reason being, if they're cirrhotic and we're going to use soft cladosphere, we're already going to add ribovirin. It's only in those non serotic patients where you're just going to use 12 weeks of soft cladosphere and you're not going to use ribovirin that there's kind of an actionable item, uh, so to speak, if you find resistance. And so, again, for our non serotic genotype 3 patients, we are checking um, for baseline NS, NS5A RABs. And if we have a Y93H, we do uh, try to add ribovirin if we can. So, in the last couple minutes, I'm just going to talk about retreatment of DA failures. And I Everybody jumps to resistance when you talk about DA failures and, and that resistance is impacting the responses. But this is coming back to you have to think of the whole patient, obviously. And I think there's lots of things to consider when you're thinking about retreating somebody. First, what did they get? Uh, you know, did they get interferon with the DA? Now we're seeing mostly those patients have kind of come through the system and, and are largely gone. But what DA regimen did they use? And then as I put here, did they get suboptimal or maybe submaximal therapy? How long were they treated? Did they get ribovirin the first time around? They got ribavirin the first time around. You're, you're kind of more stuck, actually. Um, what medication classes? Obviously, in the resistance. But then again, are they cirrhotic? Most of these patients are going to turn out to be cirrhotic. Those are going to be the ones you're generally going to see failing. Problems with adherence, and then drug interactions. And, and these two references here refer to the proton pump inhibitor issue with soft lipidosphere. The first one from Target suggested there was an impact of proton pump inhibitors in multivariate analysis. Not being on a PPI was associated with SVR. Um, it was about 97 versus 92 percent, 93 percent um, SVR. But then at the European Liver Meeting, there was a from the TRIO group. There was another presentation that suggested no impact of PPIs, with the exception of the subgroup that was on BID PPIs. So a high dose BID, they did see a uh, trend towards an effect there. So for our practice, what we've done is if patients don't have a great indication to be on a PPI and they're okay with us, we stop it, doing that, and see how they do. Um, you know, I think we use, we use a lot of PPIs, and a lot of patients can get away with being off them for three months. I think you will run into patients who, you know, have had Barrett's or something like that, where you really don't want to 
maybe necessarily take them off. And then we're just then very careful about managing the dose according to the recommendations, which would be no more than 20 milligrams of omeprazole or the equivalent, and have it co-dosed with the HCV regimen with the sofloditrosphere. So what is the data for retreatment? There's not much. So this was a study that looked at sofloditrosphere failures. They were retreated for 24 weeks, no ribovirin. 71% SVR rate overall. All of it depended on whether they had resistance going in. So no resistance going in, 100% SVR. If they had RABs going in, 60%. And there seemed to be this dose response, too, with some of the worst ones, um, maybe having a lower response for Y93H, although small numbers. But there was a second retreatment study from the NIH. These are patients that actually failed a quad regimen, or triple or quad. So they got sofloditrosphere plus a PI. Some got four drugs plus a non-nuke. But they were treated for short durations, four to six weeks, most four weeks. And they just retreated them with 12 weeks of sofloditrosphere, no ribavirin. And you can see they had a 97% SVR rate. And so you're like, what the heck is going on? Um, you know, and baseline RABs really didn't make a difference. Um, there, and, and they did have Y93H had been selected. Eight of the 32 patients had a Y93H. There was only one failure. And I think, you know, as is almost always the case, the devil's in the details, right? So they're just very different populations that are failing. The patients that failed in Eric Lawitz's study were getting recommended standard of care therapy. They were cirrhotics. Um, some were treatment experienced. And, and the regimen they got would have been expected to cure over 94, 95% of patients. Whereas in the NIH study from Eleanor, um, they were getting ultra short duration. And the SVR rates for these short four, to four week regimens was only 20, 40, 20 to 40%. So already you're taking a non cirrhotic population and giving them a regimen that was only curative in up to 40%. So, you know, you've got the majority of those patients would have been cured if they would have gotten this the first time around. So I think they're very different, right? And then again, they specifically ex excluded cirrhotics, half were cirrhotic here. Now, the resistance mutations were not really different. So it's just, I think this is more applicable to the patients you're going to be seeing in your practice that are probably going to fail DA regimens if they do. And th this gets to the point, this is, this is with cephosphorus plus pegylate interferon and ribavirin. It's just with any of these new DA regimens, it does very well against patients with traditional negative predictors. It's only the very few patients where you start piling up multiple negative predictors that we start to see some cracks in how these regimens perform, right? And so here with, with just cephosphorus plus peg ribavirin, you needed to get to four negative predictors. These were the negative predictors they considered before you started to see a decrement in SVR. And I think the way to look at it is that NS5A RABs are another negative predictor, um, but not an ultimate arbiter of how they're going to respond. And then ribavirin, our friend, comes back. So these were these 10 patients that failed in ion-4. Um, nine were retreated with 24 weeks plus ribavirin. You see, end of treatment, everybody was suppressed. There was only one virologic failure, so 89%. So um, this theme is emerging where you may just be able to retreat patients. Don't really need to worry about their resistance, particularly if they got, say, 12 weeks of soft dips for the first time without ribavirin. They fail. If you come back with 24 weeks and add ribavirin, Limited data, 20 patients here, 10 patients here, that suggest they're probably going to do fairly well with that approach. Um, so I won't go through this. This is kind of really just recapitulates what's in the guidelines about how to think about this. Everybody with DA failures, I would get resistance testing. It makes us all feel good, I think, as infectious disease doctors, HIV physicians. Then if you find resistance to, find, to go with a regimen that doesn't have cross-resistance, right? It's just intuitively satisfying to do that. And so I think that's probably still the to go. If you don't have NS5A RABs, like I said, I think you could go soft with dipospere 24 weeks plus ribavirin, and you're probably going to do very well. Um, it's the patients that have high level RABs to both where there's not a lot of consensus about what you could do. Again, you could just try to do 24 weeks with soft with dipospere, 16 weeks plus ribavirin with elbosphere grisoprevir, but I don't think we really know. I'm going to skip over these two and talk about just this study. So this is the future. This is one of these triple class regimens now. And these are in, well, the phase three studies are enrolled and the follow-up is ongoing. So now we're taking, in this case, it's the phosphor plus velpatosphere, so a nucleotide plus this next generation NS5A, and adding in a pangenotypic protease inhibitor as well. And this study was the first data we saw in a large number of patients. These were all DAA failures, 128 DAA failures. 90, 99, uh, 77 had RABs, so there were some genotype twos and threes in there. But with 12 weeks, no ribavirin of this triple-based regimen, all in patients who had failed DAAs before, 
essentially 100% SVR rate across the board, again, including these patients who had high-level baseline resistance. There was a single failure, of course. It was a genotype 3 still uh, with cirrhosis. But I think this is, you know, um, there's a whole series of phase 3 studies. Um, there's a similar regimen that uses grisoprevir um, plus a next-generation NS5A plus uh, another nucleotide, um, MK3682, that looks very similar to this kind of study that um, we'll be expecting data for as well. So I think these triples are where we're going to be going for these DA failures probably, especially if we need to get away from ribavirin. And I think I'm going to skip genotype 3 and go to, we can talk about it if people have burning questions. But so just to summarize, um, DA-based treatments are just as effective in HCV, HIV co-infected patients. Um, drug interactions are the major consideration, the eight-week caveat that we talk about. Reinfection, certainly more frequent, I think, in co-infected patients, maybe even more frequent than active injection drug users. Seems a little odd to think. Um, but this is where we need these renew renewed efforts on patient education and risk reduction. Resistance, particularly NS5A resistance, can adversely impact responses. Adding ribavirin in an extending duration may go a long way to combat that. But the triple-based regimens, I think, will mop up a lot of the rest. Um, and they're efficacious for DAA failures. Okay. I said I was going to try to leave time for questions, and I haven't, but um, I'll be around. So thanks. Okay. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we generally try to wait at least a month. Um, oh, I didn't repeat the question, did I? That's why you're laughing at me. I was like, that wasn't that bad an answer. So the question was, um, how long, if we make a change in our antiretroviral therapy regimen, how long do we wait before uh, starting HCV treatment? So again, uh, we generally try to wait about a month. Um, what, what that obviously lets us do is make sure they're going to tolerate the regimen. We generally will also get an HIV viral load at that four-week time point um, to make sure they're suppressed. I can't even say necessarily we wait to see it come back before we might start the therapy if they have it. It all depends on the switch you're making, too, and, um, you know, how risky a switch that is. This is where dolutegravir, obviously, has really helped us all out a lot um, as we think it looks PI-like in terms of its resistance barrier and forgiveness. Um, I don't know. Has that been your experience? Are you guys using a lot of dolutegravir to treat your co-infected patients? I see not. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I glossed over it, and now it's coming back to bite me. So genotype 3 was the question to talk about genotype 3. Um, so genotype 3 is definitely the most difficult to treat now, um, particularly the genotype 3 cirrhotic. Um, so our regimen that we would use now is cefosfavir plus decladosphere um, if we're going to treat a genotype 3 today. Although I will say now, so I didn't show you the genotype 3 data for cefosfavir velpatosphere. And so there's this, there was a study called the Astral 3 study, which was the phase 3 study just dedicated to genotype 3. And it was actually a randomized trial against the standard of care at that time, which was soft ribavirin for 24 weeks. So it was all genotype 3. They got 12 weeks of soft velpatosphere, no ribavirin, versus soft ribavirin for 24 weeks. Um, and it, soft vel was statistically significantly superior. I think the overall SVR rate was somewhere around 95, 97% for soft velpatosphere. But when you looked at the subgroups, Two subgroups came out that didn't do quite as well with soft velpatosphere for 12 weeks, no ribavirin. It was treatment experience patients, actually. There was a signal, there was a clear signal here. Treatment experience patients were around, around 90%. And then cirrhotic patients, treatment experience or treatment naive, were also around 90, 91%. It's a little interesting because soft decladosphere, we didn't see that drop off in treatment experience. It was only the cirrhosis. So I think when that reg and that regimen is going to be approved end of June. So generally now for our genotype threes. Even cirrhotics, we're just kind of waiting for most of them if we think we're going to have access to soft velpatosphere. So when that's approved, what would I do? Um, if they were a cirrhotic patient, I would certainly add ribavirin. So I would be doing soft velpatosphere plus ribavirin for 12 weeks. There's no data on that. It's all extrapolated from the soft decladosphere experience where those cirrhotics went from about 60% to about 90% with just the addition of ribavirin in 12 weeks. I think the trickier issue is the, the treatment experience patients. What I would certainly do there is do resistance testing because that Y93H still impacts it. And if they're a treatment experience non serotic and they had Y93H, I would certainly add ribavirin as well. Uh huh. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Interesting question. So the question is, since, um, see, I can learn, <laughs> kind of. Um, the question is with resistance testing, since HCV kind of fundamentally different than HIV in that we don't think there's an archiving mechanism, would you do resistance testing right at failure or shortly after failure, or would you do it right before you were going to treat somebody? Um, we don't have any, so one, I'll say with the NS5A resistance mutations we kind of showed, they're probably going to stay. Um, and so we kind of are doing it, I would say, closer to failure time than to when we retreat. Now, I guess it depends on the patients too. Most of the patients that fail the DAs were looking, were already, were scheming pretty quickly about how we're going to try to retreat them. So we're generally getting it either Probably not their SVR4. That's when we'll first, we're still checking in SVR4, HCV RNA. So that's when we'll see relapse in most of them. And we probably would just bring them back in, in you know, a month or two weeks and get a resistance test done. Um, the, the only data that might point to um, a persistent impact despite not having detectable resistance anymore is from PI resistance data, so HCV PI data. Those resistance mutations tend to go away pretty rapidly over time, and the data that's followed patients after they failed PI-based regimens and had resistance suggests that by a year and a half, even by, populate, by population sequencing and even deep sequencing, 96% have lost their resistance mutation. But then in HCV target, they reported that patients who were retreated with soft plus semeprevir and had previously failed a PI regimen, um, they did have a statistically significantly lower response rate to retreatment. Now, they didn't have resistance data and all the, they had almost no resistance data, but they were treated fairly long after their first round, so we would have expected it to be gone in probably most of those people by population sequencing. So there's this, this persistent kind of, you know, does it still matter even, even though it's not detectable by population sequencing? And then again, I think the other big thing is that just that they failed a DA regimen, they're a different patient anyway. So even if I didn't have resistance, I, I would treat them probably with a little, I would certainly add ribavirin and probably go as long as I could get regardless of resistance. Uh -huh. hmm. Yeah, so the question is, um, we don't think HIV co-infected patients have a different response, but maybe are they different in how the liver recovers after you've eradicated hepatitis C? Um, and Nina's presented some data, and we certainly think HIV itself now is certainly starting to emerge as potentially um, being hepatotoxic, if you will, in its own right, or at least affecting um, liver fibrosis and, and the, how other uh, things like alcohol act on the liver. So we don't know, I think, is the, is the short answer, really. Um, we're interested in doing that in the, within the ACTG. We have this long-term cohort where we're trying to, we're trying to get FibroScan in there as well. Right now, we don't have it built in to, to follow these things long-term. And, you know, APRIs, fib 4 they're going to come down because they're based on transaminases, and those generally come down nicely in patients um, once you eradicate HCV. And if they don't, you need to look harder for fatty liver disease or other things, I think. But... Um, whether FibroScan might have some role, you know, and well, certainly we're going to get natural history. Now, does that correlate then to outcomes? One of the big questions is risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, right? How long do you screen somebody if they were cirrhotic, they're cured? Screen them five years? Do you screen them 10? Do you screen them until their FibroScan comes down? You know, I don't think we know. I think, I think we'll get an answer to those questions eventually. I... I tend to think we probably won't be screening indefinitely. I think there's going to be some inflection point, probably, right, where, where either they were pre, they, they were kind of going to get their HCV, and, and you know, you wait long enough, the people who are going to get it have gotten it by now, and then the people you're continuing to screen are just going to be low risk, and or the fibrosis has, has improved enough that the liver truly is kind of no, no longer that substrate. But we don't know right now. Right now, we're just kind of following everybody and screening them. You do see it's 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 kind of gratifying if you if you treat we have a few decompensated cirrhotics we've treated with our hepatologists you know because um, we didn't really have transplant and, you know you see the platelets come up um, in a portion and albumins and go up INRs come down all that kind of stuff but we'll see yeah do you guys screening indefinitely now yeah yeah which is indefinitely right. 
Sure.